This lecture is part of a series of lectures for RAD 229 MRI signals and sequences offered in the Department of Radiology at Stanford University. The 12th lecture, Pulse Sequences Part 5, is broken down into three parts, and Lecture 12A covers gradient hardware and constraints. The learning objectives for this lecture include being able to recall gradient performance specifications for commodity and high-performance MRI systems, to appreciate the role of voltage, current, and power as they relate to gradient performance, distinguish between the logical image and scanner or physical coordinate systems, to understand the different gradient limits used to constrain gradient waveform design, and to describe the basic peripheral nerve stimulation and acoustic noise models. When it comes to gradient waveform design, uh, there are several things to consider, both the goals and the underlying constraints. The goals include things like spatial encoding, image contrast, motion encoding, and speed and SNR efficiency. And while we seek to achieve or meet all of these goals, we're also faced with many constraints. And those constraints can take the form of being hardware constraints, things like the gradient maximum amplitude and the slew rate maximum, or physiologic constraints like peripheral nerve stimulation and acoustic noise. Of course, there's many other constraints like pulse sequence constraints and field imperfections, but in this lecture in particular, we'll largely focus on gradient hardware and physiological constraints. It's good to review uh, gradient performance specifications and a commodity or sort of run of the mill uh, gradient system would be specified or engineered to, develop, um, to deliver 45 millitesla per meter um, with 150 tesla per meter per second slew rates on a per axis basis. This gives rise to a 300 microsecond rise time to the gradient maximum. Of course, higher performance gradient systems are increasingly of interest, but also come at an expense. They provide performance on the order of 80 millitesla per meter and 200 tesla per meter per second per axis, which gives a rise time of about 400 microseconds. So a slightly longer rise time, but of course, achieving a significantly higher gradient maximum. And there are now so-called ultra-high performance gradient systems, highly specialized systems only available at a handful of institutes that include things like the connectome gradient system and some head-only gradient systems with very high gradient maximums and uh, very high slew rates. Uh, and the product of the gradient maximum and the slew rate, of course, gives some indication of the underlying rise times as well. Driving these gradient systems are the gradient amplifiers themselves, and the best gradient amplifiers provide about 500 amps at about 2,000 volts, which is about one megawatt per gradient axis, the power being simply the product of the current and voltage that can be delivered. Now, of course, these systems can't deliver these voltages and currents continuously, but they can do so on the scale of seconds or minutes for the pulse sequences that are typical of MRI imaging systems. If you have higher current, you can deliver or, or generate a higher gradient maximum. And if you have higher voltage capability, you can generate uh, faster slew rate uh, uh, limits. These are also systems that are driven at about 200 kilohertz, meaning we control the step size of the gradient waveform uh, raster at about five microsecond steps, depending on the exact uh, system available. It's interesting to think about what's required in terms of hardware. Uh, or gradient amplifiers if you want to accelerate your scan by a factor of two. So if we think of a conventional gradient waveform as being a trapezoid and requiring or using potentially as much as uh, one megawatt, which accords with a, a concept Formula One electric car, we can think about if we wanted to cut this gradient waveform duration in half, we would have to do two things. We'd need uh, approximately 2x uh, the current for half the gradient duration so that we can get 2x the gradient maximum. But we'd also need four times the voltage so that we could cut the rise time in half, which includes a 2x increase in the slew rate max or a 2x increase in the gradient maximum. And this means that in combination, we need approximately an 8x uh, increase in available power per axis. And this gets you into the range of uh, very large uh, wind turbine uh, power supplies needed to run each gradient axis. And of course, you can extend this to uh, you know, a higher level and say, well, what if we wanted to go four times as fast or eight times as fast? And you could quickly see that the power demands could be uh, very, very, very high. Now, this example is certainly imperfect in, in certain ways because there are ways of 
developing more efficient gradient subsystems uh, where they turn a certain amount of current into uh, a greater amount of field. Uh, but nevertheless, it's important to, re uh, to recall that even the best amplifiers are very high performance uh, instruments uh, and can form some uh, limit to uh, what systems can currently deliver. The gradient amplifier itself can be modeled as a inductive resistive circuit. And this is a simple circuit model reflecting the voltage in that LR circuit as a function of the current being driven into it. And of course the resistance in the inductance. So this amplifier is uh, connected to this gradient coil and can be modeled as an LR circuit. In doing so, uh, we can uh, come up with some constraints for uh, possible gradient performance. Given a specific uh, gradient waveform that we want uh, to generate, uh, the gradient maximum will be governed by some efficiency and the underlying current, whereas the slew rate will be proportional uh, to the time rate of change of the, of the current, as well as some underlying system efficiency, eta. We can combine these two general expressions into the LR circuit model to derive a model that relates the slew rate and the gradient as a function of time together with the underlying LR circuit model. And this equation itself maps out possible constraints for uh, the range of gradients that we can, uh, gradient amplitudes that we can generate and the range of slew rates that we can generate. And interestingly, it maps out a trapezoidal space uh, uh, where we can see that given a certain amount of maximum available current, we would generate a maximum gradient amplitude or given a particular voltage maximum or low gradient amplitudes, we would have a specific uh, maximum in the uh, slew rate. Now this space of design is uh, within the uh, dotted lines represents what the power amplifier is capable of. But from a systems perspective, it's a little bit complicated to think about designing sequences uh, with voltage and current limits. So here we can see uh, just more carefully delineating what's hardware achievable in terms of slew rate and gradient amplitude as a function of the gradient coil's maximum voltage or the power amplifier's maximum voltage, the gradient coil's resistance, the gradient coil's inductance, uh, and then the maximum current that can be generated uh, by the system of the underlying gradient coil efficiency. So why don't we program sequences with voltage and current limits? Well, principally we don't do so because we don't directly think of the MR physics as being governed by voltage and current uh, per se. And so it's easier for us to think in terms of gradient maximum and slew rate limits. And so this is simply easier to code and it's more directly tied to the encoding uh, targets of our um, pulse sequence design. So more typically, we, we limit ourselves to the slew rate limit uh, achievable space and the gradient maximum achievable space which is just rectangular uh, in the space rather than the trapezoidal voltage model limited specifications. Now, another important consideration when it comes to gradients is that we have several different coordinate systems that we operate within. When we think of imaging, we more typically think about the logic, the logical or the image coordinate system. And one of the unique strengths of MR is the ability to acquire images with arbitrary obliquity or arbitrary scan plane orientation. And we typically think of designing pulse sequences in the space of the logical or image coordinate systems. The scanner, of course, though, is a physical system uh, and we have to power the gradients in the physical space. So the gradients are applied in the space of the physical or scanner coordinates. Now, of course, these two coordinate systems are related to one another through a rotation matrix where we define some logical coordinate system of interest. We can relate that back to the physical gradient system through some rotation matrix. But we have to use caution uh, um, so, that we do, so that any rotation R does not allow uh, the physical gradients to overrange the hardware limits, which is uh, more apparent in the next slide. So here we think of a typical, say, spoiled gradient echo sequence uh, with specific requirements for gradient amplitude during phase encoding or uh, readout, for example. And this may specify the hardware allowable limits uh, for a particular uh, gradient system. And if our rotation um, matrix is simply the identity matrix, then the logical uh, and physical gradient, uh, logical and physical coordinate systems, of course, correspond with one another. And we could, in principle, operate anywhere within this space of the gradient 
readout axis, maybe the x-axis, and the gradient phase encode axis, or y-axis. So note, this is the space of gradient uh, magnitudes, uh, but not the same space we were showing previously that included the slew rate. This is the two-dimensional space of gx and gy. Now, the problem arises when the rotation that relates the logical and uh, physical coordinate systems is not in fact the identity matrix. And so if we had designed a pull sequence to operate uh, at least at some point in time at, at both the maximum of GX and GY, it's possible that with a rotation to a different uh, imaging plane, in this case, just a, a small left-hand rotation, we could easily overrange one of the gradient uh, specifications uh, for say the X axis, uh, while we're still within limits of say the Y axis. And so this becomes problematic. We've, we've uh, requested that the system would uh, overpower itself, which of course the systems would um, uh, have software protection and hardware protection limits to prevent that. Uh, and, and essentially this means that we're requesting uh, acquisition of an imaging plane with specific gradient amplitudes that cannot be achieved by the system. So this presents an uh, interesting design problem when it comes to uh, designing pulse sequences to work more generally. That is, ideally, you might want to design gradient waveforms that would work uh, regardless of the scan plane orientation. So one way to go about doing that is to simply limit uh, the, uh, the root mean square, uh, the RMS of the two gradients that you're using, say the GX and uh, GY gradients, such that uh, the square root sum of the squares is less than some hardware maximum. And this actually works reasonably well uh, but it ends up coupling the design of the phase encode and readout gradients. And so that becomes a little bit trickier when it comes to uh, specifying exactly what amplitudes are allowable for a specific uh, uh, point of the pull sequence. An even simpler constraint is to limit independently each of the gradient axes to be G max divided by root two. But the downside of this is this represents a significant derating uh, or a significant um, uh, constraint uh, relative to the maximum available gradient hardware. Uh, the advantage, of course, is that if you design within the constraints of the square root of 2 derating, that image plane can always be rotated by any, or, uh, by any amount and will always perform within specification. So, for example, if you think particularly at this point here of operating at the, uh, at the maximums that are specified as Gmax by root 2, then this point here, when rotated, would still be an allowable uh, gradient amplitude maximum. And so the scanner could still run it. Now, of course, this actually carries over into 3D, in which case uh, we would ideally need to limit uh, by root three rather than root two. Uh, and so this further limits uh, the, the gradient maximum that would be allowable uh, by, the under, by the software uh, so that you don't overrange uh, the hardware capabilities. Uh, of course, the downside again is that your system is actually capable of much higher gradient maximums, uh, but uh, to avoid overranging the system, you've derated your system significantly. And by using the RMS derating, you've decoupled the constraints so that it's individual for each axis. So this offers a very conservative way of ensuring that your pull sequence can be played with uh, arbitrary three-dimensional obliquity, but it also means that your TEs and your TRs have become quite extended because you're nowhere near using the maximum uh, of your hardware capabilities. This is actually a very widely used approach. This is common to lots of commodity pull sequences, uh, but it's one that, at least in my lab, we think should be generally avoided when possible. So let's think about some other constraints uh, that come into play uh, uh, during the design of gradient waveforms. One of them is peripheral nerve stimulation. And in general, the FDA limits the dB, dt, the time rate of change of the field, so tesla per second, to less than 20 tesla per second continuous exposure, where continuous means you know, seconds or longer. Uh, and so this is a, uh, sorry, a very coarse description of the field exposure uh, limits that are allowable. In general, you need more sophisticated models of stimulation uh, if you're going to especially model the effects of the time rates of change of fields that we see in magnetic resonance imaging and the prop propensity for those time rates of change to induce peripheral nerve stimulation. Uh, but again, it's important to pay attention to the units that are Tesla per second, how much the field overall is changing per second. And the problem is that if magnetic fields are changing uh, too much in amplitude uh, 
uh, uh, per unit time, it can actually lead to so-called peripheral nerve stimulation, which is a buzzing or tingling sensation uh, that subjects or patients can feel uh, while being exposed to uh, the changing gradient magnetic fields. So general hardware specifications again here for gradient maximum of say 80 millitesla per meter and a slew rate max of 200 tesla per meter per second. That actually uh, together gives rise to a rise time of about 400 microseconds. And these imaging systems may have uh, fields of view max, uh, maximums of about 50 centimeters or plus, uh, plus minus 0.25 meters. And so the question is, is this limit exceeded? And the answer is yes, it can very easily be exceeded uh, for, um, uh, uh, for at least short periods of time while the system is slewing. Uh, that may or may not be enough to actually stimulate uh, and that's why a more sophisticated model is needed. This is just another example of how to make that same calculation. So the bottom line is our gradient systems are certainly capable of peripheral nerve stimulation, but the specifics depend on the gradient waveforms uh, and, and the sort of adequacy of the peripheral nerve stimulation model that's being used. So why does this happen? Well, any applied B field, so the time radiant for change of the gradient fields is of course a B field, any B field that uh, changes with time will also induce electric fields. And it's actually those electric fields that are responsible uh, for um, uh, gradient-induced peripheral nerve stimulation. So one model of peripheral nerve stimulation uh, tells us that uh, both the stimulation strength and the stimulation duration uh, matter. And so if the strength is weak and the duration is short, you're, you will not stimulate um, some uh, nerve. Uh, but as the stimulation strength gets longer, uh, or as the stimulation duration gets longer, you have an increasing probability of going super threshold and stimulating that underlying nerve. Now there's two characteristics that, def that define these kinds of curves. Uh, this is sort of simplified descriptions, but still useful. One is the Rio base, which is the minimum infinite duration current amplitude that depolarizes a nerve, so the asymptotic value of the stimulus strength. And this is that 20 tesla per meter, uh, sorry, 20 tesla per second threshold that we were discussing earlier uh, as one example. And then we also characterize what we call the Rio base, uh, sorry, what, uh, this should be the chronaxi, which, which is the value of this threshold at twice the Rio base. So the minimum time required for an electric current that's twice the Rio base to depolarize a nerve. And there are, of course, um, various uh, estimates of these kinds of thresholds throughout the body because it can be anatomy specific and person specific. Uh, and in general, there's two principal uh, considerations. One is the PNS limit for peripheral nerves that is stimulating sort of uh, someone's neck or the, their lower back while they lie in the scanner. Uh, the other possible concern is the cardiac limit that you could actually stimulate the heart. Uh, this, this threshold ends up being quite a bit higher, and so generally we have to maintain the peripheral nerve stimulation limit uh, uh, and, and, and don't have to be quite as concerned about the cardiac limit. So this is uh, one model of, of uh, how we can estimate the peripheral nerve uh, response, and it takes into account a couple different things. This is basically just a convolution of the slew rate function, so the time rate of change of the gradient waveform, uh, with uh, a function here that's the, the nerve response function. And the nerve response function depends on several parameters that we just discussed. It's, uh, this model is a per-axis model, uh, and we'll see why that matters in just a second. We need to take into account uh, the Rio base and the chronaxi time, and these are actually gradient coil specific values. So it depends on uh, the geometry uh, and the field specifications of your particular coil. Uh, and those in turn will govern the Rio base and the chronaxi time. And then you can calculate the SR max as just being the Rio base divided by the length of the gradient system. Um, so convolving with these coefficients, uh, your uh, slew rate function will give you a value of RI. And if we just take uh, the square root of the sum of the squares of the individual thresholds, that will give us some indication of the likelihood uh, that an individual subject would or would not be stimulated by a particular set of gradient waveforms. And so-called normal operating mode on the scanner insists that this pre-threshold be less than 80% at all points in time. And first level gradient mode, which is sort of an exception mode that can be run on the scanners, will allow for the, the p-threshold to be right up against the threshold, so less than or equal to 100% of the threshold.
So here's one example of uh, what this could look like. So with high performance systems, uh, it turns out that peripheral nerve stimulation doesn't limit as often as the slew rate itself. And so you can program to be slew rate limited, uh, but it may be more time efficient to program to be PNS limited. So here's an example of a bipolar gradient waveform that's slewing it uh, at the slew rate maximum. It's relatively short in duration, two milliseconds encoding a velocity uh, encoding strength of 80 centimeters per second. And if we convolve the, the slew rate of this gradient waveform uh, with the above function, uh, we can see that uh, while we don't reach the, um, the peripheral nerve uh, stimulation threshold for this very first slew, we do uh, reach up and approximately uh, uh, cross or, or reach the, uh, the peripheral nerve stimulation limit uh, at the end of this rather long slew here. And so when it comes to pulse sequence programming, just exceeding uh, the threshold for you know, five microseconds can be enough to trip the PNS uh, safety model. And the consequence is that oftentimes pulse sequences are uh, derated by uh, factors of you know, four or more. Uh, just uh, because of a small uh, trespass of the sequence limit for short periods of time. And this is, of course, a very inefficient approach uh, to handling this. A more sophisticated approach uh, would use an optimization method uh, to design top time optimal sub-PNS threshold waveforms. And so we won't get into the detail of it in this lecture, um, but you can see that it's possible to design a gradient waveform that dynamically slews and does uh, come up against uh, the threshold limit, uh, but could be just sub-threshold, but still uh, produce a shorter gradient waveform. And so in terms of all-out efficiency, one can imagine designing uh, threat, uh, gradient waveforms that meet any specific uh, uh, threshold uh, target. So you could choose 0.8 to be in, uh, um, in um, the normal operating mode. Uh, and still have a gradient waveform that was more time efficient than something that was uh, controlled by slew rate alone. Another consideration when it comes to gradient waveforms uh, is uh, gradient uh, uh, noise, right? And so if you've ever had an MRI scan, then you know that the MRI system can be very, very loud. The pulsed gradient currents um, that are used to generate the B fields uh, are also uh, primarily induce eddy current fields that turn that in turn generate Lorentz forces that cause the cryostat and the RF coil and other uh, hardware elements within the scanner to vibrate and generate acoustic noise. Secondarily, uh, themselves they interact with the B0 field to generate Lorentz forces that produce mechanical vibrations of the gradient coil. So there's several sort of acoustic elements within the MR system that uh, you know, taken together generate quite a bit of noise uh, while the MR system's gradients are operational. And switching gradients on uh, the scale of milliseconds, uh, which is really accords with kilohertz, generates acoustic noise on the scale of kilohertz. And so, of course, this is right within the range of normal human hearing. When we look at the possible uh, noise pressures that are generated by MR systems, uh, MR gradients under sort of basic loads are about 75 dB, so a little louder than maybe uh, listening to the television or, <clears throat> or listening to some music. But when you run the MR gradients at full load, this could be much higher, uh, approximating 100 decibels, which would be you know, a lot uh, loud live concert music, or, uh, but not quite as loud as being close to, say, a car horn. So in general, hearing protection is required for research subjects and patients during MR exams. And engineering ways to uh, reduce sound pressures in MR systems remains relatively elusive. Lots of approaches have been tried, but the systems still remain relatively loud. One model for this uh, takes into consideration several things. Uh, you can have so-called perceived loudness, so how loud you or I would think the scanner is as a function of frequency. So we would notice uh, different uh, amplitudes of uh, sound pressure uh, as a function of frequency. And that would depend on the product of the spectral content of the pulse sequence. So of course, how loud we perceive something depends on how we're driving the gradients themselves. So the Fourier transform of the gradients as a function of time. The gradients as a function of time might be trapezoids or triangles that are turned on and off at, at particular points in time. We can simply take the Fourier transform of that and see what the frequency spectrum looks like. 
and then uh, measurements can confirm that the frequency spectrum uh, that turns uh, that comes ac across inside the scanner itself, of course, shares uh, cro uh, very uh, close similarity to the analytically expected uh, frequency spectrum from the gradients that are being driven themselves. The other thing that matters, of course, is the acoustic gradient response, uh, and that is going to be scanner specific, perhaps gradient axis specific, and it's also going to depend on where within the scanner you're actually measuring this. And so this is uh, how much sound pressure is generated as a function of frequency for a particular scanner, uh, and perhaps the frequencies that we uh, care quite a bit about would say be in the 3000 hertz range, just to pick an example, uh, so that we can compare that to uh, the loudness that's actually perceived by a, a person. And this is actually really well mapped out so that we know uh, what intensities uh, uh, people hear as a function of a range of frequencies. And so this is the overall loudness perception. It's subject uh, specific, uh, but it shares these kinds of wave uh, uh, sort of frequency dependence um, and has a maximum se sensitivity at about three or four kilohertz. And so this is a really common uh, range of frequencies to be excited by a pulse sequence. You can see some of that uh, expressed here. And so the product of all of these things can lead to overall loud, perceived loudness by the subject within the scanner. So how could we use this in gradient waveform design? Well, it's tricky, right? This acoustic gradient response is certainly non-zero, although engineering teams work to push this down as much as possible so that the system is not generating acoustic noise for particular frequencies or ranges of frequencies. There's nothing we can do about the loudness perception uh, that people uh, uh, have uh, with, uh, other than perhaps uh, using uh, earplugs and headphones and things like that. And so what we're left with is considerations for designing uh, gradient waveform uh, spectral frequency content to minimize overall the perceived loudness. And this is a very challenging engineering problem uh, that's not really um, widely used in MRI pulse sequence design, but it's something that I think could be considered further uh, and is an interesting area of research. So that covers uh, a handful of the constraints and limits that we face when designing gradient waveforms. In the le next lecture, we'll discuss uh, various practical aspects of how we design actual uh, gradient waveforms for specific purposes. So click the links below and join us for the next lecture. Thank you.